All right. Okay, well, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. James Brumall, an Associate Professor of History at Shepherd University, as well as the Director for the, of the George Heather Moore Center for the Study of the Civil War. Um, welcome. Uh, this is part of a series of conversations that we've been having since the beginning of the pandemic. And as always, um, we deeply appreciate your time this evening. We hope that you and your loved ones are staying well, staying healthy, and I'm um, very excited for tonight's program. Um, as many of you know, there have been uh, many conversations most recently um, in the past couple months, but over the past several years about the, the public place, the public memory, the public role of monumentation and statuary in the public arena, as well as on National uh, Park Service sites. And so today we have an eclectic group. They're going to be discussing this in a conversational way. Uh, we welcome you as always to join into the conversation by placing comments in Facebook. Uh, my assistant uh, at the center, Catherine Oliver, will be moderating those comments and uh, injecting uh, questions into the conversation as it evolves. Um, and joining me today as sort of the co-moderator, co-host, is my great good friend, uh, Dr. Jay Wyatt. Uh, Jay is the director of the Robert C. Burr Center for Congressional History and Education here at Shepherd University. We've been friends since I've, uh, I came to Shepherd and uh, longtime collaborators. Uh, we use his facilities quite often for our um, events. So we're happy to host you today online um, for one of our events. And um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Catherine who is going to introduce our distinguished panelists for this evening. And once again, thank you all very much. Um, so I'm just going to go in alphabetical order this evening. Um, first off, we have Dennis Fry. Um, welcome, Dennis. Uh, Dennis uh, spent a few decades working for Harpers Ferry National Historical Park as chief historian um, and also has a long history of preservationist work. Uh, we're very honored to have him with us this evening. He retired from the Park Service a few years ago, uh, but remains active in our preservationist causes. So thank you, Dennis, for being with us. Uh, we also have um, Sarah Hempel Irani, who is a sculptor. Uh, whose job as a sculptor focuses primarily on making monuments. So welcome to the discussion, Sarah. Uh, then we have uh, Kevin Levin, who is an author and educator. Uh, he's the author of a number of books and his educational background has focused primarily in teaching high school history. So welcome, Kevin. Uh, then we also have Alan Spears. Alan works for the National Parks Con Conservation Association as a senior director for cultural resources. And we are looking forward to your perspective tonight as well, Alan, so welcome. All right, thank you all for being here. Great, thank you so much, Catherine, uh, for those lovely introductions. And, and again, the, the main focus today, and Jay's gonna talk a little bit about this as well, is to really have a, a conversation that is just that, a conversation. Um, at points in, in this discussion, we will probably disagree with one another. And I think that's part of the beauty of a democratic discourse. Um, we also, I think in many ways, are trying to sort of model um, some pathways to move this conversation forward. In some instances, it seems as though um, we're in a deeply divisive period uh, in which the conversations become defined entirely by strict binaries. That's not necessarily very productive or fruitful. And so this conversation came together rather organically and, and we're hoping again that um, at the end of the day, there will be a series of either historical perspectives, um, preservationist dilemmas, uh, questions about the, the place and role of art, uh, but this is first and foremost an educational endeavor and that's exactly what we're trying to do this evening. Um, Jay, do you wanna elaborate upon that at all? Yeah, I, I, you know, I think your point about sort of modeling uh, how we talk about really difficult, contentious, fraught topics in a, in a civil society is really a big part of what this is about. Um, demonstrating that, that, you can, that you can do these sorts of things. Um, if we're not seeing too much of that right now. I think uh, there's a lot of currency in not doing that right now, but you know, I think to sort of find a pathway forward through all of this, um, it's only gonna happen through, through conversation and, and uh, you know, making a concerted effort to, to meet people where they are and listen to what they have to say. Thank you. Um, so we, we've prepared a, a series of questions, but I thought it'd be most useful to sort of start the conversation off by allowing each of our participants to, to offer sort of a statement, a perspective, 
um, an idea as to how they're coming to this approach. And so with that, I'm going to start it off with a historical lens and I'm going to turn uh, first to Kevin. And again, these are just very brief sort of statements, but I think they're going to create a platform and a foundation for the conversation that's going to follow. And so with that, Kevin, take it away. So thanks, Jim, and thanks again for including me in this discussion. Uh, you know, as someone who's followed this, uh, this debate and has sort of studied the history of the controversy surrounding monuments, I am struck um, by what's happening right now on Monument Avenue in Richmond. Uh, we've talked quite a bit about the connection between Confederate monuments specifically uh, and the Jim Crow era where, you know, that period in which many of them uh, were erected and dedicated. And, you know, Monument Avenue to me is a wonderful example of that connection. Um, you know, those monuments were uh, part of a new neighborhood uh, in, in Richmond developed at the turn of the 20th century. Uh, if you look at the real estate ads in Richmond newspapers, uh, those monuments beginning with the Lee Monument in 1890 was, um, you know, you could see advertisements with the monuments in them. Um, you know, for these open lots. And if you read the advertisements, uh, you'll see a little fine print saying uh, people of African descent are, should not apply essentially. And it speaks to the work that these monuments on Monument Avenue and elsewhere uh, have did throughout much of the 20th century to reinforce uh, segregation, how they racialize space. And what we've seen over the last eight weeks or so uh, is the city reclaiming these spaces and specifically Lee Circle. I think over the last few weeks, more black Richmonders have stepped foot on Lee Circle than the last 130 years combined. And I think we need to come to terms with that as a way to understand the past and also as a way perhaps to begin to think about how we're going to reshape these public spaces. And so that's something I've been thinking quite a bit about uh, in recent days. Wonderful, thank you. Um, Alan, if I may turn to you, and uh, you've had a, a pretty storied career working with historic sites and historic places and, and monuments in sort of a, a broader sense. And so with that, um, if you could offer us some perspective. Yeah, well, uh, thank you for including me in, in this program and on this panel. And um, I think maybe the place where I want to start is to say that from the National Parks Conservation Association perspective, and from my perspective as a lifelong advocate for the National Park Service and the National Park System, that we think that there's a difference between uh, Confederate monuments that are on national park land and Confederate monuments that are in public spaces like Richmond's Monument Avenue. And uh, the one significant difference, say, between the Lee statue on Monument Avenue and the Lee statue at Gettysburg is that no African-American person has ever had to walk past the Lee statue on Seminary Ridge in order to register to vote or to serve on a jury. And that makes them fundamentally different. And um, I think maybe this is more of a personal than a professional thing that we have spent like the last 20 years dumbing down the national consciousness of this nation. And we find we have an opportunity, I think, with Confederate memorials and, and uh, monuments on National Park Service land to actually to begin to have a conversation, maybe about a couple things. It is possible that these monuments have some intrinsic historic value and may be able to help enhance public understanding of the Civil War and particular battles and campaigns. That could be a good thing. But even if they don't have that, they have the ability when properly interpreted by the National Park Service to start conversations, conversations that talk about why they were put up in the first place, what they meant in 1906, 1956, or 1963, and what they mean now. And I think it is important that we embrace this teachable moment. Our national parks, places like Manzanar, a Japanese American internment site, or the Underground Railroad, we do not celebrate these places and keep them on the landscape because they're cute and cuddly. We keep them because we need to interpret this history and understand what happened then. So perhaps we don't make the same mistakes moving forward. And I think we want this in the hands of the National Park Service, an agency that for an awful long time has had to deal with these challenging stories and this challenging history so that they can help people to understand where we're coming from, where we've been, and maybe help to raise that level of consciousness in this country. Uh, in a way that leads to better discourse and better understanding and perhaps even a little bit of healing. Wonderful. Um, thank you, Alan. Uh, Dennis, if I may. Uh, 
It's great to follow up with my friend Alan. He and I were spent many, many hours, days together on preservation battles to protect national parks. And so we formed quite a bond over the years. And uh, I'll follow up uh, with, with basically you can summarize the purpose of a national park in two words, uh, preservation and education. That's what we do. It was a privilege for me every day to come to work as, as a public servant, as a public park ranger, chief historian at Harpers Ferry National Historical Park, um, and work on those two things every day, preservation, education, preservation, education. So this, this discussion we're having today fits into both of those categories, preservation, education. And I will mention also that national parks typically bring about two other words, awe and awful. When we think of the Grand Canyon, awe, or Yellowstone, or Yosemite, or Glacier, all you, you stand there in quiet respect and reverence for that scenery before you. It is, you can't describe it. You must witness it and see it. And you walk away in awe. In fact, you never walk away. It becomes part of you. It becomes part of your soul. You never forget that moment. But we also have national parks that represent us as awful. Alan mentioned one site, the Japanese internment site at uh, Manzanar. But another example is Andersonville in Georgia, uh, a National Park Service site, a Confederate prison indeed, but it really represents all prisons, North and South during the American Civil War and the awfulness of those places. The Trail of Tears is a national park and it truly is a trail where you can follow this, this terrible experience of the relocation, forced relocation of indigenous populations from the east to Oklahoma and all the death that occurred along the way. The Sand Creek Massacre, November 29, 1864, where over 230 native are killed by the United States Army, uh, women and children and older people mainly. These are not places of all. These are awful places. And I just want to finish with St. Louis, not the city, not the town, but that arch, that arch, that invitation to the West, the arch that represents the gateway to Western expansion. Well, within view of the arch, only a few blocks away is the federal courthouse. Federal courthouse there that dates to the period of the Dred Scott decision. And the principal thing we interpret at that location is the United States Supreme Court validating, justifying in the strongest language that we are not a nation of equals and that slavery should be justified and remain legal. That's what that place means. And we have that. We, the people of this country have that site and these other sites to remind us that we have been a nation of imperfection. And so this discussion we're having, not just now, but over the last months and actually years dealing with these monuments is a reflection of how America looks at itself, how we reflect upon ourselves. And those reflections change. Wonderful. Um, thank you, Dennis. And, and finally, Sarah, um, I can turn it over to you to, to bring us home. Thank you so much. And thank you for including me in this discussion. Uh, I would like to kind of follow up with, with what Dennis has to say about, um, about monuments being a reflection of who we are as, as people. And as, as a person who creates monuments, um, I have to spend a lot of time thinking about what is it that this is saying? You know, um, a lot of times people think of artists as people who are very interested in self-expression, which we are, but monuments and public art is about community expression. It's not about ourselves. It's not about me so much as it is who, who is deciding what work of art is going up, who are we commemorating, why are we commemorating this person or this event, um, where is it located? Um, what does this space mean? Who's included? Who's excluded? And um, as we, we 
are in this tradition of, of monuments, you'll notice a pattern. It, there's a lot of guys on horses. We tend to make our heroes military, these military heroes, these people have fought in battles. And if you, if you look around Washington, most of the monuments are monuments to war. And I have a little story that sort of changed my perspective on this. Um, as, as a young artist, I was working for a company that made people for museums. And we were, I was working on a project for the US our, um, Women's Army Museum. And, and I'm working on this portrait of, of the first woman who won a silver star in combat. And um, you know, I'm really excited about it. And the, the owner of the company who's an avowed pacifist comes up to me and in a very sober face, he says, do you realize we are part of the military industrial complex? And I looked up at him, I said, what? I'm an artist, no, oh, I'm a free thinker, you know? And, and he says, we make propaganda here, Sarah. And, and he said, yeah, it's a good job. And you know, we, do, we also do um, educational uh, um, exhibits in museums and such like that. But, but he said, we make people feel okay and even really good about war. And it sort of sat with me and it sat with me for the past 20 years about what, what is that I'm doing. And, and a lot of these, these monuments are in fact propaganda. I mean, all of them are really. And, and propaganda is not necessarily bad, but, but it sort of encapsulates ideas, ideals that, that we share. And I, for my own um, vision for the future is how can we take our shared values that are, that are the best of who we are, that are our, our inventors and our creative people and, and, and people who brought up peace. You know, when the, when the MLK Memorial came to the mall that really changed the landscape. And that was really something new. Um, and, and it's a, a place, I, I take my child there every Martin Luther King Jr. Day, and it's awesome to see the people gathered and, and in the space. Um, it's not just a statue, you know, it's a whole environment. It's not without its flaws artistically or design, um, but the space is powerful and it's awesome. And it creates that for people. And like the Lincoln has changed. I mean, when it was unveiled, they, it was segregated seating and people left in, in protest of it. And, and then when Martin Luther King spoke, you know, it transformed that space into a different kind of space. And I, I think the people in Richmond are transforming that Lee sculpture and, and they're making something new out of it, something that can include them into this history and to this, the future that we're, that we're moving into as a nation. Um, so it's, it's, I mean, it's exciting to be a part of it and, uh, and to imagine this future we, where we have values that, that we're all, you know, it, the deep, most deeply held American value is, is um, equality for all, liberty for all, and, and to include that in our monuments and um, express that, that we all can participate in it. Uh, wonderful, everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, and again, I, I, I think the idea here tonight is to, again, give some variety of, of perspective, also some educational um, backgrounds, and um, just try to talk this out. And so for those of you tuning in, thank you. Again, Catherine is uh, carefully and diligently monitoring, uh, but welcome. Um, I'm not on Facebook right now, thankfully. I'm just here with you all. Um, and so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jay, who will get us started. But again, if you have questions as the program progresses, please feel free to leave a comment. If we can't get to them during the program itself, uh, we'll go back and, and, and mine them and see what we can resolve or answer. So um, thank you all very much once again for your time. Sure. Uh, thanks, Jim. So first question, I think, is really picks up on a lot of what each, each of our guests tonight alluded to or spoke specifically to in their opening comments, which is a sort of ongoing struggle to form a more perfect union and how sort of the, the sites that we commemorate sort of fit into that. So my question is, um, the efforts to raise Confederate monuments or most Confederate monuments occurred within a specific context in the early 20th century, right? A uh, context of um, sort of curtailing African-American civil rights and, and um, you know, uh, reinforcing and building uh, Jim Crow society. So as we think about these monuments and these conversations today, um, what are the key features of this present historical moment that are driving these conversations? 
Well, I, um, I'll give it a, I'll give it a start. Um, I think timing really is uh, important when we talk about some of these Confederate monuments. Um, you know, part of the thing is that the South in the immediate aftermath of the Civil War was in no condition to start throwing up monuments just from a financial or social perspective. So it took them a while to get going. So there is that part of the argument. But um, if you take a, a look at a battlefield like Gettysburg National Military Park, by my count, there are about 38 Confederate statues on the field at Gettysburg and 20 of those were erected uh, in either in 1920 or before 1920. And um, if you take a look at the statistics, the nadir of race relations is occurring during that time, about 105, 107 African-Americans who were lynched in 1901, 86 and 1902. Um, and so it's clearly a time of very harsh segregation. And I think for the monuments that are on the battlefields on park service managed lands, and the ones that are in public spaces, we do have to recognize that there is a great deal of trauma that is associated for some people with those monuments. I think that's a good place to start. Uh, but then I think the conversation has to evolve again, as I said, to talk about what we can do regarding a teachable moment for these monuments that are on National Park Service land, because I do think that they are a breed apart. And uh, so the context is key for this. The timing is key. Um, and public sentiment changes. But what I would also share with you is this, from my perspective um, as an African-American person, and I don't claim to represent anybody but myself, and sometimes I don't even do that very well. But if you think about the passing of someone like Congressman John Lewis, a real hero and an American icon, here's a gentleman who walked all the way across the Edmund Pettus Bridge and got his brains bashed in. And if you want to try to suggest to me that someone with that level of bravery, and there are hundreds if not thousands of John Lewis's out there, would be frightened by a statue of Robert E. Lee on horseback at Gettysburg, or a statue of Stonewall Jackson at Manassas, I'd say you've lost your mind. So I think we need to have things within a context to suggest that yes, there is some trauma, but let's also be realistic about what that trauma looks like, what it means for people in a realistic sense, and maybe do something to just sort of quiet down the mob mentality about this a little bit so that we are actually listening to all voices in this conversation, not just the loudest ones. There's, there's a concurrent um, thing happening uh, at the time of uh, the height of segregation, Jim Crow, Plessy versus Ferguson, uh, Supreme Court decision in 1896. We, there's a parallel. And that parallel is that veterans, men who fought in the war, North and South, are at the zenith of their political power at that time, from about 1890 to 1910. These men control the White House. They've been controlling the White House, veterans, since uh, U.S. Grant. Uh, so we've had almost 50 years now of veterans of the Civil War period in the White House. Uh, the first that wasn't was Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, he, he was not a Civil War veteran. Um, so think about that, half a century of control by people who fought in the war, not just in at a 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, but also in the Congress, the Senate, the House is, is principally veterans of both North and South. And so one of the things that's happening um, uh, from about the 1890 to 1910 period is this desire, this strong urgency that they recognize at this point that they're about to die, that they're getting old, that they're becoming, their bodies are breaking down and they want to commemorate themselves, uh, veterans commemorating themselves. This is not something new in our country. We commemorate veterans of all wars, it seems. Um, and, and sometimes it takes a while. Think about how long it took us to build the World War II Memorial on the mall in honor of our World War II veterans when most of them were in their 80s by that time. And so a lot of these monuments are built by veterans, sponsored by veterans. The design is approved by veterans. The dedication is full of veterans. Veterans speak at the dedication and, and they're commemorating themselves. They're commemorating their time on American battlefields. So this is concurrent with the Jim Crow segregation 
period, absolutely. Uh, but it is a different perspective. I might add that when these monuments are dedicated, these memorials are, these people show up, there's, there are very few of any African-Americans invited or present for these experiences. They're not included. I mean, it is absolutely their role, uh, their experience is something that is not included at all when these memorials are dedicated on the battlefields that later will become national parks. I, I, I think Dennis makes a really good point regarding the time frame. We can look at other um, historical events and that roughly 50 year period that it quite often takes for the monument or the commemorative landscape to begin to take shape. And I think, I think Dennis is also right regarding the role of veterans. I mean, I think that's certainly true when it comes to um, you know, United States veterans by this point in time. And obviously it's also true for Confederate veterans. And you can look at an example like the Lee statue uh, in Richmond, that was a veterans organization that had a good deal of, um, of, of, of a role to play in that process. But obviously we do not want to overlook you know, the importance of the United Daughters of the Confederacy during this period, because really they took the lead in organizing, fundraising, designing, you know, um, commissioning you know, the, the statues and monuments for these public spaces. But I think we also need I think we also need to remember that an organization like the UDC, you know, it never saw the monument, shaping the monument landscape as divorced from uh, or separate from shaping the minds of a new generation of young Southerners, right? Uh, young boys and girls who did not experience the war. And especially, and I think we often overlook this, did not experience reconstruction. I think a lot of the Confederate monuments uh, that go up during this period, we have to understand as a response to white Southerners, white Southerners experience during the reconstruction period. Those monuments are a celebration of redemption, right? It's a celebration of the return of white supremacy to local and state government. And, and I would just add, um, let's not forget, you know, in terms of the UDC's vision, their most important work obviously is in the control of textbooks. Uh, that school kids are using throughout parts of the country, uh, large sections of the country. Um, and obviously that control is about uh, making sure that the South, the Confederate cause, um, is seen as morally justified, that Lee and Jackson and others are celebrated as Christian warriors, and that Lincoln and others are obviously, um, you know, um, not celebrated. But, um, but I do think we really need to, to sort of dig into the ways in which this monument landscape really is. Um, again, I, I like to use the, the sort of the language of doing the work of segregation, um, helping to maintain and manage white supremacy by the early 20th century, especially in, in the, the Jim Crow South. I might add that uh, it's not just the Jim Crow South. The segregation is prevalent in every Northern city and throughout the North as well. We often think of our racist society as being south of the Mason-Dixon line. It's the whole country. It's, it's the whole country. We are a racist nation. Certainly de facto, uh, you know, yeah. segregation we can talk about outside of the, of the south, absolutely. A, a good example, perhaps, um, is the, um, the Shaw Monument in Boston Common in Massachusetts. Now, this monument is in honor of the 54th Mass. Uh, done by one of the world's most famous sculptors. Uh, I'll let you address that, uh, Sarah. Um, and it's, it's a beautiful sculpture. It, the detail is incredible. And it took, it took uh, St. Gaudens a long time to work on this particular piece. And he brought in models, uh, so African-Americans, so that he could, he could model them very closely and make it just very, very uh, detailed. But what's the centerpiece of that monument? It's not the African-American soldier, it's the horse. It's the equestrian with Shaw, the white man, on top of it, leading his men. Now, that is historically correct, because when we began to recruit men for the United States Collar Troops, we didn't trust the African-American soldiers to lead themselves. We believe that only white men could lead these men into battle. And so, although we have this example of, of a, a heroic regiment, um, that suffers so many casualties, uh, especially uh, in South Carolina in, in the Battle of, of, of Battery Wagner. Uh, 
Um, the monument says a lot about who we are, Sarah, going back to what you said. It's a reflection of who we are. And your eye goes immediately to Shaw. Everything else is background. You know, um, I think part of telling history is is who's in control of the narrative. And so, when, you know, when the daughters of the um, Confederacy are, are their narrative is different than the northern narrative is going to be different than the African American narrative. And so, the people who are in charge of putting up the sculptures are in charge of the narrative. And when we expand our views of who can be in the conversation, our art is going to change and evolve. I mean, it it could have been that, um, you know, the Shaw Memorial, that he, he was in the background and, and his troops were in the foreground. You know, that maybe would, how a modern artist might interpret it from a different point of view, possibly. I mean, it is hard to, to say anything bad about St. Gaudens because he's a hero, you know, he's, a, he's an incredible sculptor, but you're absolutely right that it, it places the troops as kind of the, the extras in the, in the movie, you know, and, and the hero, the real hero is Shaw. And, and monuments are largely about who are our heroes. And I think now in this time, we, we hear a lot about representation in media, in movies, in magazines, in toys, um, who's being represented. Can we see our own reflection in our heroes? And you know, it's really changing rapidly in the entertainment industry and sculpture is a long tradition, you know, that goes back to Greece and Rome and um, this kind of sculpture, I should say, this kind of commemorative sculpture, you know, has roots in, in uh, classical Greece and Rome. Um, but, you know, when I first moved to Washington, I remember, you know, oh, so I'm from a rural um, town in Michigan and all of a sudden all these sculptures and I, I had made sure that I visited as many as I could. And, and I was like, where are all the women? Where's anybody else? You know, where, where's anyone who looks like me or some, you know, and, and it's really gotten me noticing. And a lot of people don't notice, you know, the sculptures, the, the monuments in our cities and towns tend to kind of be, be in the background, but they, they've become like in us, you know, it's, it's like we don't notice them because they're not new. They're not um, novel. They're, they're part of, of course, these are our heroes. Of course, you know, we take that for granted rather than, than asking, well, from whose perspective, you know, what, whose, whose story matters here? And uh, we clearly have had, you know, um, a very particular narrative being, being driven, but it's changing and, it, and it's exciting. Wonderful. Um, so again, uh, thank you all. Uh, thank you to our audience for tuning in. Um, at this juncture, Catherine, do you want to throw in an audience question or questions? And I just unmuted myself because so, some questions I think were prompted by your discussion of, of women, Sarah. Um, the question that we received was, how do we distinguish the Ladies Association monuments from the UDC monuments that, that they inherited and how the meanings possibly changed? Does, can anybody speak to that issue? I can't say I, I know enough about the, you know, I've paid more attention to the artists and the works than um, who's commissioning them, though, though who's commissioning them and, and the, the meaning behind them is, is obviously important, but I don't know enough about this particular group. Well, there, there were organizations, both North and South, that existed prior to what we think of as the, the historic organizations like the United Daughters of the Confederacy, Sons of Confederate Veterans, or the Grand Army of the Republic. The Grand Army of the Republic is, is actually a group of Northern veterans who collectively come together and, and become very powerful uh, politically uh, in, in, in the North. Uh, tens of, ten, hundreds of thousands of men become members of the GAR. Um, and so in the South, we have uh, Confederate veteran organizations that uh, basically mirror the uh, GAR. And, um, and then we have the ladies' organizations. The women in the South, uh, long before the UDC has actually comes on to the scene as the United Daughters of the Confederacy as a formal organization, but you get commemorations well before um, these, uh, uh, these more large organizations. In fact, uh, there's often debated who actually created the first Memorial Day. Uh, it's, it's a fun debate. Uh, but some will argue that the first Memorial Day, known as Decoration Day, 
uh, historically actually came from Southern women uh, commemorating um, the dead, uh, their patriots uh, from their point of view on these battlefields in the South. And um, so uh, some of these monuments are created prior to the advent of an organization like the United Dollars Confederacy. And that may address the question, Kathy. Yeah, I, I think that question was referring to maybe the Ladies Memorial Associations, which obviously is a precursor to the UDC. And right. Maybe right. one distinction we can draw here is that their work, you know, dedicating some of those earliest Confederate monuments were focused mainly, as I understand it, in, in cemeteries, right? Their work was, right. remember, we're talking about that period of military reconstruction. So their their options uh, in terms of where they place some of these memorials uh, is, is quite limited, right? Veterans themselves are limited in certain ways in terms of what they can wear in public, how they can gather. And so, you know, many of their monuments were placed in, in cemeteries. So think of places like Winchester, Virginia. Right. Then the most obvious one is the pyramid in, um, in Hollywood Cemetery in, in Richmond, Virginia, where you have thousands of Confederate soldiers, many of them disinterred from, from the Gettysburg battlefield, right? Like in the eight, yeah. late 1860s. Right, yeah, it's, it's, um, that's exactly right. Um, the, these organizations predate the, the mass organizations and these commemorations were underway pretty early. And um, for example, going back to veterans, I believe the very first monument on a Civil War battlefield is constructed about six months after the Battle of First Manassas. Yeah, that's correct. Francis Bartow Monument placed there by his brigade on the field. It was under Confederate occupation at that time. And he, of course, is mortally wounded there. And, and so they, they place a monument, a marble monument in his honor on the battlefield. Um, and then Manassas is again uh, visited um, in 1865 when uh, two more monuments are built uh, in honor of artillery at Manassas and then soon thereafter Manassas becomes kind of a focal point, but we need to keep in mind that, and Kevin alludes to this, there was no place to put a lot of these monuments because the national battlefields, the national military parks, as we know them today, the national military parks, they did not come into existence until 1890. The very first ones were 1890. So it's almost, well, it's more than 25 years after the war is over. Again, it's at the time when the politicians in the House and in the Senate represent the veterans at, their, at the zenith of their political power. And so they not only do they want to commemorate themselves, they want to preserve the spaces where they fought, but they didn't choose all the battlefields. They were very selective. They only chose five. Uh, in the Park Service, we always referred to them as the big five. Um, and it was Chickamauga, Chattanooga, that's one. That was the first one in 1890. The second one was Antietam, a few, three weeks later, Antietam. And then we had Gettysburg, Shiloh, Vicksburg, those were the original five that were created during the decade of the 1890s, again, because of the veterans. So once that public, those were public spaces under, under the jurisdiction of the United States War Department, War Department, we today call it the Department of Defense, but they called it the War Department. Uh, they managed these places and you could not put a monument on a battlefield unless you receive permission from the Secretary of War. So I had to go all the way to the secretary, which would be as equivalent today of the secretary of defense. The design had to go there. The amount of money needed to, to do it uh, usually was, was confirmed on and on and on. A lot of bureaucracy before any one of these monuments could be built. So we need to keep in mind, uh, there's another parallel that these public spaces that the federal government owns and maintains don't really come into existence until 1890. And, and, and quickly, and we could put this in the comments section, but the definitive account is really burying the dead, not the past. Um, uh, from Strap UVA, uh, Carrie uh, Janey, uh, who talks about the La Ladies Memorials Association and then Gaines Foster's book, Goes to the Confederacy, gets into the creation of the UDC and some of the um, male veterans organizations. Um, but thank you all um, for, for getting some of the deeper perspective. I want to bring it back, though, into, into the present era and go back to some of the comments that both Alan and Sarah made. So I'm going to combine a couple of questions here because the time, it goes so quickly. Um, so Sarah's talked about maybe potentially thinking about the landscape through addition. What, what, what monumentation or statuary can we add to the landscape 
in order to, to create a more inclusive um, space or, or a more holistic environment. And Alan has, has quite rightfully said for those monuments that remain on sites like the National Park Service, which at this point, the removal would be arduous and it would require legislation if I'm correct. Um, how can we make those monuments more educational? Um, I don't wanna use the word useful, but, but how can they do a heavier job? How can they do a heavier lift than they do currently? So in other words, right now, an audience member consumes the audience through whatever knowledge he or she or they bring to the table. Is there any way that we can thoughtfully enhance this monumentation through signage, whatever? So, so my question then to boil it down is, is one, are additions to the landscape useful? And then two, for those monuments that do remain, and many will, how can we make them more educational and friendly spaces? And maybe we could start off with Alan and the bounce to Sarah and then broaden it out to, the, to uh, Kevin and, and beyond and, and Dennis. Uh, well, thanks for tossing that over to me. I have one answer in 12 parts with several subsections. So um, I'll start now and wrap this up around 9.45. I, um, I can tell you spent a lot of time working with the Congress. <laughs> I, you know, part of the, the question that I have is, um, don't hit me, do we actually need more statues and monuments? Or are there different ways to commemorate the new stories that we want? And one of the things, and Dennis might be able to speak about this um, in a more detailed way, but Gettysburg National Military Park had a reputation very early on as being far too cluttered with monuments yeah. and memorials. Yeah. So um, now is the best way to fix this to now have a monument to U.S. colored troops who had no role in any kind of the fighting there, at least in no formal sense, or uh, Frederick Douglass, or do we have one for Abraham Bryan, who had a farm right on uh, the middle of Pickett's Charge Field? So I'm not entirely sure that adding stuff would be um, would actually be additive and a way to move forward. I think in terms of how you interpret these things and maybe make the ones that are still on the landscape useful uh, in the current context that we're looking for, which is maybe racial justice and healing and giving them that responsibility as well as some responsibility for historic interpretation, you got to increase the National Park Service budget. And the reason why you have to increase the National Park Service budget is because we need more interpretive rangers and more historians. There are roughly about 18,000 people who work for the National Park Service right now, 419 units spread all across the country and the territories. I am told that the service has 133 historians. So if you want to write interpretation that brings these statues up to the present day and create a 21st century park system for a 21st century America, that deals with justice and racial healing, you've got to have people who can write that kind of interpretation, who can provide that kind of interpretation, and who can do it equally, where it doesn't matter if you've got a tour group that's got nothing but Black Lives Matter t-shirts, or you've got a tour group that comes with nothing but uh, Daughters of the Confederacy t-shirts on. And that's one of the things that folks at Harper's Ferry did so well. Uh, and that's one of the things that really good interpretive rangers at good national parks do very well. So we got to support. And one of the things that folks should know is that between 1995 and 2008, the funding for natural resource work in the Park Service increased by 71%, along with about a 31% increase in the staffing levels for natural resource work. During that same period, funding for natural resources decreased by 19% and staffing levels decreased by almost 30%. You mean cultural resources? Cultural resources. I'm sorry. Thank you. Cultural resources did the decrease by 19% for the funding and 27% for the uh, staffing levels, which means right now at the very time when we most need interpretive rangers, bringing Dennis out of retirement, um, we don't have them to tell these stories and to be on these battlefields. And oftentimes history becomes a collateral duty for the agency that in this country is the closest thing we have to a ministry of culture. And that's the one thing that's got to be fixed. So if we want a 21st century park system for a 21st century America, we got to treat that like a priority and fund it like a priority. If I may, since I worked for the Park Service for three and a half decades um, and saw this de-evolution away from professionals um, in management positions and also staff positions, I will say that when I came into the Park Service, every national battlefield, everyone had a chief historian. When I left the Park Service two years ago, 
there were only two of us as chief historians that had professional history backgrounds. And, and I, I, one of the reasons, and thank you, one of the reasons why I, I sort of always think very deliberately about panelists is because um, many of you are actually engaged in the work. It's very easy from, from my perspective to sort of pitch out uh, broad-based ideas and not deal with austerity measures or, or lived realities. And so thank you um, for bringing that perspective to the fore. And for those of you who are advocates uh, for the national parks, um, we, we have to advocate, right, uh, for this type of work to be done, uh, which is political, which is outside my purview of what I can do on this program. But um, I, I think we need to heed the words of Dennis and Alan very carefully. Um, I have a lot of friends in the Park Service and it's, it's, it's been just frightening to see um, the cuts that have been enacted. Um, with, with that said, I'll, I'll turn her to a more idealistic vision of, of Sarah, who is an artist. And so Sarah, for you though, I guess there is a dawning, um, you know, when, when you did see more statuary, um, that was more representational for, for what, what you wanted the landscape to reflect. And, and you know, I think you use the word heroes. I think you're right. There's a deeply militarized narrative that we have that's embedded in the landscape. Uh, and I'm a person who studies war. Um, so, you know, I, I can't fault that necessarily, but um, so not that I'm an advocate, <laughs> um, but I, I guess explain to us though, you know, from, from your perspective, what, what is the power then of be it a female figure or, or even something that's not in human form. I mean, I, I think we can start broadening out this conversation a bit. I mean, um, you know, what are some of our more idealistic options? Um, yeah. Well, I mean, obviously I'm, I'm a little biased uh, to figurative sculpture because that's what I do. And, and I'm like, yes, more statuary. However, I, I think that statuary in, in a battlefield versus a, uh, on the National Mall or in front of a courthouse or in a cemetery, they serve very different functions. And I don't know that statuary is necessarily the best teaching tool. You know, these are, are sort of exclamation points on the landscape rather than interpretive. And so I would completely agree that, you know, more funding needs to be to um, professional historians and even interpretive spaces like museums or uh, the visitor centers, you know, where some of them have, have incredible exhibits that really help guide the experience. And interpreting these stories um, goes beyond the battlefields and into, you know, a lot of school groups come and what are the stories that we're telling our, our children? And as we grow up, you know, we all grew up with sort of this certain kind of American mythology. And then as we you know, study more history, we're like, mm, maybe this isn't the whole story. And, and what voices are we missing? And, and so I think we're, we're pivoting on that. So I would, I would completely agree that maybe more statues at the national parks aren't necessarily the answer. However, I, I do see in public squares, there's, there's something very human about like, let's put up a statue in the middle of it and people gather around or, you know, go meet me. I remember when I went to Paris, you know, let's meet at the Balzac. You know, we, and, and we knew where to meet. And, and so there's something deeply human or, about doing that. Uh, so, but I think we need to, to, you know, the people who are commissioning sculptures are, you know, it, it's expensive and um, you have to get a lot of buy-in from communities, from politicians, from city officials, um, that sort of thing. So, so bringing in diverse voices into what's going up and, Sometimes it's dangerous to have art made by committees. Um, so, you know, a certain respect of, of artists and architects and landscape designers. Uh, I don't think that the figure is the end all be all of public art. There's, there's some very powerful non-figurative art, the, the most famous of which is the Vietnam Wall. I mean, is there a more powerful space in Washington? You know, this, it, it, the presence of, of that space is sacred and reverent and holy and awe-inspiring. And it's not because of the figures, you know, it's because of the, the landscape design and the wall. And, and people gather there, though, though I think it's important to distinguish between monuments, memorials, um, didactic tools, you know, when we have sculptures in cemeteries. They're, they're there to remind us that we remember those who have fallen. 
But when we put it in front of the courthouse, it serves a different function. And, you know, in Frederick, we, we had um, Raj Tawney taken down from the courthouse and people tried doing it peacefully for years and years. And then somebody put some red paint on his face and eventually they relocated it to the cemetery. Um, sometimes these things don't come down or move very peacefully, um, but it's, you know, it's the community who, who, what voices do we listen to? I think that's very difficult in a time when you have a lot of desperate voices um, who have different ideas. How do you decide on one particular hero or is there space for many of, I think there's a lot of space um, for these things. So uh, yeah, as we move forward, some people have proposed leaving the pedestals blank to say that we've removed those and, and the, the poignancy of them being blank. I can see how that could work also. Kevin writes about that. Uh, I think you had that experience in Czechoslovakia in Prague uh, where you saw the former, well, I'll let you tell the story. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> certainly, well, yeah, cer well, Sarah, I don't want to cut you off. I mean, no, please. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, certainly that experience uh, provided a, a bit more context to see, um, you know, I tried to imagine uh, at the time I was thinking, you know, the argument was uh, you can't remove statues because you're erasing history. And I'm sort of walking through the streets of Prague asking, can I imagine, you know, approaching someone as they're pulling down a statue of Stalin or Lenin, that you are erasing history. It's, it's an absurd argument, it seems to me. Uh, there's no way they're going to forget their history, right? The pulling down is about understanding that past and beginning to move beyond it. I want to go back to something Sarah just said, and, and the rest of you, because um, I'm really struggling with it. And that is, I'm all for adding to the, the landscape with new statues. Let's have them reflect the voices and the faces in our communities. That's, that's what it's all about. But I think in regard to the, this whole debate about Confederate monuments, oftentimes the addition argument has been made as a way to diffuse the question of the Confederate monument. So the idea being that somehow if we add a statue next to Lee, somehow that places them in balance and we don't have to worry about the Lee statue. Uh, or the argument is if we just place interpretive panels uh, you know, next, to, next to these monuments uh, and try to explain them, placing them in historical context, that diffuses it, right? And I've, I think what we're seeing now is that that's just not going to work, right? And I think the argument that what, it's not being stated explicitly, but certainly through their actions, uh, you know, over the last few weeks, and even going back to 2015 and the Charleston murders, um, I think what we have to sort of deal with is that, as my friend in Charlottesville says, that these Confederate monuments remain blunt instruments, right, in the end. And I think going back to Alan's very early point about the distinction between Confederate monuments in public spaces and in Gettysburg, while on the one hand, I think Park Service uh, interpreters, man, they are the best at this, right? Taking uh, the battlefield, taking the monuments and interpreting them for their visitors, man, they are on the front lines of this and doing a great job. But I still don't think that you can take the North Carolina monument um, on Seminary Ridge and diffuse it given that it's pointed directly at the Bryan farm across the way, right? How do you take a monument that celebrates Confederate soldiers, right, for their bravery, everything else that goes with the lost cause, given its relationship to the property of a, of a black family that was forced out of the town of Gettysburg during that campaign? It's just that tension is always there. And this is just some of the things I've been thinking about listening to the rest of you. How do we really move forward, you know, without dealing with that, that sharpness of, of the monuments themselves, right? Um, they never lose that. You can never turn them into fully educational sites, it seems to me, but, but, but maybe I'm, I'm wrong. Well, I appreciate the point that you make, but I think the, the idea behind either the North Carolina Monument or the 11th Mississippi Infantry Regiment Monument is to not put comfortable fuzzy slippers on that stuff. Right, right. But it is to talk about maybe the interpretive panels to talk about why Abraham Bryant got the heck out of Dodge mm -hmm. in late June of 1863 and what happened when Albert Jenkins uh, irregular cavalry showed up in Gettysburg and started dragooning African-Americans people who had never been south of the Mason-Dixon line and sending them back into slavery. They had never been enslaved. 
And yeah. So there's an opportunity there. And I think, you know, just quickly to your point, Kevin, it's not that I think an interpretive panel next to that takes the edge off. What I want to do, and maybe dumbly and naively, but I still want to do it, I want the edges. I want the difficult conversation. And again, it goes back to the point that I made at the beginning of this. We have done a great deal to dumb down this country. So everybody knows who the mass singer is. Nobody knows who their elected representative in Congress is, right? Let's make our parks, not sanitized landscapes, but places where all Americans can gather and have these tough conversations. National Park Service could be a bit of a referee or at least an interpreter in that mm -hmm. and help people to understand where we've come from and how that's impacting us today. That's not supposed to be an easy conversation. Yeah, and I just real fast, I certainly think that the Park Service is capable of doing that, right? I mean, I, I'm with you 100% in that regard. Well, we're very capable of doing it. Uh, in fact, uh, my staff at Harper's Ferry, uh, we loved controversy. We didn't run away from controversy, we ran to it. We embraced controversy, but we didn't personalize the controversy as park rangers. Our job was not to take a position. Our job was not as a park ranger, a public servant of the American people. Our job was not to express our personal opinions about anything. For goodness sakes, my site is John Brown. Uh, you, two, two more controversial words associated with a human being in America, it's hard to find John Brown. But we encouraged people to bring their opinions to our park. We wanted to hear what they had to say. And we wanted them to say it to each other in a space that is available for public debate, that the public owns, and the ranger truly was a moderator who allowed people to express themselves. And we did this without any monuments. There's no monument to John Brown in Harper's Ferry, yet we had endless good discussions uh, where people present different points of view, different perspectives, different opinions, and they debate uh, John Brown. Very successfully, we were able to do that. So um, it, what would you suggest, Kevin, at Gettysburg with the North Carolina Monument? It, uh, is removal? I don't think oh. suggesting removal, but what, how do you deal with that? Yeah, I, I don't know, Dennis. I mean, I, I think that's a great question. I mean, and I'm not advocating the removal of the right. monument to Gettysburg. Uh, that, that really wasn't my point. It's just to say, it's just to say that quite often you, the argument seems to sort of veer to, toward the belief that, that we can diffuse. And I hear, you know, um, Alan has already mentioned that that's not the goal. And I, I, I take him at his word and, and others. I just wonder for certain people who visit that field they are bringing, you know, sort of uh, certain expectations. Uh, there are plenty of people who are alienated stepping on Civil War battlefields. We know that over the years, whether it's having to see a Confederate battle flag or, or to see Lee hovering over the Gettysburg battlefield, right? Um, you know, how, how, I guess I'm still sort of struggling with how you deal with that, that fact. Um, it's, but I'm, I don't have any answers, so. <laughs> and and I, I don't think we need to, right? I mean, that, that, I think that's part of the, the whole point of tonight is that none of this is easy. And that if you wanna have a thoughtful and engaged discussion about it, there isn't gonna be a straight and easy path forward. I mean, and that's the, that's the national conversation that I think many of us are hoping we can have. I'm not sure if we're having it yet, but, but that's certainly where we wanna, want to go. And, and on that note, I want to turn back over to, to Jay. Um, we're actually up to an hour. So um, Jay, give us a good kind of <laughs> send home question here to, to put a, a fine point on everything and give us a sense of finality. Well, you know, I think this is sort of all hovering around this idea and Kevin started talking about it when you started telling your story about being in Prague. But I, I you know, we're not the only nation who has warts. We're not the only nation who has sort of had to confront a contentious or problematic past. So, you know, and you're talking about Eastern Europe, I think South Africa, you know, I mean, so is there an international context that can inform some of these conversations and sort of providing examples, you know, pathways forward? Um, is there Americans 
tend to sort of be American centric. And I wonder if maybe as we sort of think about this, we're not thinking broadly enough about it. Well, we're, I think we're struggling with this because although this conversation has been around for an awful long time, in a lot of ways, it's brand new. And so we're still struggling to find language and definitions, and we're still arguing about the truth. What is the truth of the, star, the, you know, the, the catalyst for the American Civil War? And we still have many people out there who will tell you it was states' rights. So you got to start with your history. You got to go back and read your ordinances of secession, most of which mention slavery three, four, five, six times as the idea behind secession. So we're not yet prepared to have conversations at the graduate level. We're barely prepared to have some of these conversations at the high school level. And if you talk about an international corollary for something that could work and help with this, I go to South Africa and their Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Yeah. Um, we have toyed yeah. with ideas like that before. They get poo-pooed. Uh, but maybe now the national mood is in such a place in such a state that something like that might actually have to have to be put forth. And, and, and if I may, too, I mean, one of the things that has always struck me um, when I'm on the battlefield with a mutual friend of many of us here, Pete Carmichael, Pete always likes to emphasize, and I think he's right to do so, without the spirits in the National Park, he's one of the biggest advocates for the Park Service, but Pete usually brings up a giant picture of the Western Front. And, and the Western Front has been interpreted in a whole host of different ways, but we in the United States have a commemorative landscape baked into the DNA of our American Civil War battlefields. They're commemorative spaces, they're spaces of reconciliation in the 19th century sense. They take out a lot of the blood and the gore and the terror and the trauma of, of war. And, and, and so the monumentation adds actually to that narrative of commemoration and reconciliation. Whereas if you look at the, the blasted landscape of sections of the Western Front. Other sections are heavily interpreted, but if you look at the blasted landscape of nature sort of consuming, it's a very different vision of war and memory and, and healing in a different sense. And that's another thing to at least think about is that we as a nation have interpreted our war in a very specific way. And again, it's baked into the monumentation. So I just wanted to add that before I allow our panelists to, to keep going here. I think we can look to places like Germany who have a, a very difficult history that they have to contend with. And I, I think at least uh, in my encounter with people who are not American, they think we're almost ridiculous. Like how is it that we can even continue having sculptures in public places to the losing side of a civil war? I mean, it's almost ridiculous from an international point of view. And in Germany, they have um, very stark, you know, the, the corollary, I guess, to the battlefield, you know, historic sites, the um, concentration camps that are heavily interpreted, that are very somber, but they don't have commemorative sculptures to, to Nazis in public spaces. I mean, that would be unthinkable. I mean, it's just completely unthinkable. And so I don't know how we have put up with it for so long, to be honest with you. Um, I, I think it's kind of horrifying. And, and I do think battlefields are different because they're, um, they're interpretive spaces, which is different than a public space. Uh, but many places uh, in Europe have, have taken down all the public statuary of, of Stalin and, and, and put them in these sort of statue graveyards in a way. And that's one solution that people can still go see them. And they almost, they're decontextualized and they, they kind of, lose their power when they're all kind of jumbled up together, um, which I think would be an interesting place to visit, it would be like a Confederate statue kind of graveyard in a way. Um, so that there are places that have wrestled with this, wrestled with dark histories and found different solutions that seem to work. And uh, you know, we're young as a nation, really. And so we're still arguing about it. Um, and I'm being the optimist, I think we'll figure it out. And I hope that we put up some some new and inclusive sculptures. You no, know, it's funny because I'm my wife is from Germany, and we, when we first got together, you know, and I took her to battlefields and showed her monuments. Uh, she had no, I mean, her her she she really couldn't wrap her head around it. You know, she couldn't believe mm -hmm. some of the things she was seeing uh, in terms of the monuments and the memorials. Um, 
But in, in that regard, I'll, I'll recommend Susan Neiman's new book, What the Germans Can Teach Us, which is a wonderful, she's a philosopher taught in Germany and sort of explores Germany's response to uh, the Nazi years, along with um, how Americans have dealt with the Civil War. Um, but I'm also going to agree with Alan. I think that the, the idea of a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, I think on the local level is the way to start. Uh, and I think we see a little bit of that in those cities and, and you know, those communities that have held uh, you know, uh, sort of um, uh, city council meetings in, in sort of dealing with um, local monuments uh, to start there. And then of course, as an educator, again, I'm gonna agree with Alan, uh, it is tough to have this sort of discussion uh, when, the, when there's such an educational disparity. Um, and so, yeah, I'll just sort of leave it at that. Perhaps that's what's missing is discussion. Instead, we yell at each other, we scream at each other, we throw things at each other, we disrespect each other. We, in many cases, hate each other. That's really pretty un-American in many respects. That's not who we like to project that we are, but that seems to be much of whom we are. So maybe what we really need is discussion. Uh, we certainly have protest is good. Protest is a form of discussion. In fact, it epitomizes discussion. I think about all that's come out of protest movement. The women's right to vote is a protest movement. Um, the, uh, the labor movement was a protest movement. Uh, if you work five days a week, 40 hours a week, you can, you can thank the labor movement for that because that wouldn't exist without protest. Um, and of course, then we we're, we're quite familiar with the civil rights movement and what it's brought us. And none of these movements are really complete. They could need to move. And so what we need is discussion. We need to be able to talk to each other, not yell and scream at each other. 